Lee, and welcome to today's IFAM seminar. Uh, I'm Ron Ackerman. I direct the Institute for Public Health and Medicine, and I have the uh, distinct privilege today of uh, introducing our presenters. Uh, firstly, uh, Dr. Peter Orris is Chief of Occupational and Environmental Medicine at UI Health. He has more than four decades experience practicing internal and occupational environmental medicine at Cook County Hospital, as well as other institutions in the Chicago area. He's also a faculty member in the Department of Preventive Medicine here at Northwestern University and has taught or co-directed courses here at Northwestern on healthcare systems, occupational medicine practice, environmental health, ethics of clinical research, and a popular course that brought local public health leaders to the classroom to talk about their careers. With Peter's help, IFAM is bringing that format to the IFAM seminar series this year. Over the course of the coming year, we will have a few sessions titled Explorations of Careers in Public Health. We're honored today to be kicking off that series with an interview with Dr. Linda Ray Murray. And I will say now that next week we will do this uh, a second session in this series uh, and we'll have as our guest uh, Dr. Ezeke Ngozi, who is the uh, Director of Illinois uh, Department of Public Health. So for today, uh, Dr. Murray has spent her career serving the medically underserved. Uh, she has worked in a variety of settings, including as Bureau Chief of the Chicago Department of Public Health, De Department of Health under Mayor Harold Washington. She was medical director for the federally funded health center serving Cabrini Green Public Housing Project in Chicago. And today she continues to practice as a voluntary general internist in one of Cook County's health centers. She is an adjunct assistant professor at the University of Illinois School of Public Health. Dr. Murray has been passionate about strategies to increase the number of black and Latinx uh, health professionals and she serves on the Community Advisory Committee for the Urban Health Program at the University of Illinois, which has the mission to increase minorities within the health sciences and the health professions. So with that introduction, it's my honor and privilege to introduce both uh, of these uh, esteemed individuals today uh, to kick off this new series. And with that, I turn the session over to Peter to begin. Thank you. Thank you, Ron. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, this is very exciting um, uh, to um, reinvigorate this uh, approach that we took a few years ago. And of course, uh, Dr. Murray was a superstar of that uh, uh, initial offering some time ago. So we brought her back for uh, the kickoff for this year's uh, series that we'll have. Uh, let me say there's a number of things different about this year, and uh, one of them is the uh, Zoom format, of course. And um, let me initially indicate that at the bottom of your screen, um, uh, probably under the more um, uh, thing to click, uh, you will see a Q&A um, uh, section there. If you if you click on the Q and A section when you have a question, um, what will happen is it will come up on our screen here. Uh, I will then uh, repeat your questions uh, for the group as a whole, and then they will be moved to the answered uh, uh, section, etc. So um, since there are. Uh, several hundred people almost uh, that have signed up. Um, this will hopefully facilitate our uh, uh, getting the most out of uh, Linda for this hour. Um, the um, uh, other thing is do not use the chat section because we will not be going there uh, to uh, go for questions. Uh, this These series of sessions will be uh, uh, based uh, on um, questions about why someone uh, goes into public health, why someone goes into medicine, um, and uh, how they see their career choices, um, uh, how they were made, and why they were made. The idea at the initial start of this was primarily directed towards students getting a master's in public health, uh, or a PhD in public health, 
who either had uh, uh, nursing or medical degrees or were uh, seeking the MPH uh, as a degree with to, uh, uh, to contribute in the public health sphere. Now, I don't want to steal much of more of Linda's time from this, uh, but uh, we will uh, be interviewing people in a variety of uh, positions in public health during this period of time, as well as community activists, uh, environmental activists, all who are contributing to the public health movement today. And because we're z using Zoom this year, we're not restricted to people that we can bring in in Chicago. So we will be uh, reaching out internationally as well. And we hope we give you a good flavor of the different kinds of positions that are available uh, within this area. So don't hesitate, uh, start asking questions whenever you want. I'm gonna go with my most fascinating ones early on. We've already posted uh, a very, very abridged section of Linda's uh, curriculum vitae uh, and her academic uh, background and experience. Uh, I would only uh, want to highlight one additional thing. She is currently uh, the uh, chairman of the, or the speaker rather, of the governing council of the American Public Health Association and has been uh, the elected president of APHA in the past as well. So welcome, Dr. Murray. We're very excited to have you. Oh, good uh, afternoon. And I would like to uh, begin in Cleveland, if I might, uh, since you have indicated frequently that you have now returned to your roots as a troublemaker, now that you've retired from much of your clinical activities over the years, and uh, what uh, Congressman Lewis called, if you will, good trouble. Uh, so take us to Cleveland. What got you involved in making trouble in high school and when you were growing up? And then we'll move into public health. <laughs> well, first let me, okay, but first let me just say that um, I hope people don't view these series as simply career counseling. Um, in my opinion, every job is, is a public health job, even if most people don't realize it. Uh, but but I, as I try to explain to my son, who is a Chicagoan, born and bred, I, I'm not a Chicagoan, I was born and raised in, in Cleveland, Ohio. Um, so I was born in 1948, so during the 50s uh, when the civil rights movement, the modern civil rights movement was getting started, I was a child uh, in elementary school and, and high school. And um, I grew up in the projects of Cleveland um, and my parents were just, you know, they, my mother was a teacher eventually uh, as, as I entered high school and my father worked a number of, of jobs, bus driver, UPS. Um, so we had, a, I think, a reasonably typical a childhood in my family of a, of a black family in Cleveland. I think the critical thing to understand, and I, and I think it's useful to think about cohorts of people. Uh, so a critical thing to understand is that uh, what I did as a, as a child and as a teenager was part of what was going on at the time. So the civil rights movement was in the streets at the time. It was in the newspapers. It certainly was true in, in, uh, in Cleveland. And I was able to participate in a number of activities from uh, our Congress of Racial Equality, CORE chapter, which is one of the older civil rights organizations that really doesn't have a presence anymore. So you may not have heard of it if you're young. Um, and it was a, that was a Northern-based uh, organization predominantly. And, and so I did things like, um, actually I consider this one of my first public health activities. We had a, a effort uh, of high school students to compare the price and quality of food and meat, but specifically in uh, vegetables, produce, in Kroger stores, a big national change in the inner city of Cleveland where I lived and compared that same thing to the suburban stores that existed around Cleveland. Um, so I didn't know it was public health at the time, but it, but it clearly was. Um, so activities like that, uh, activities working around rent strikes in the inner city Cleveland um, and uh, over several years, participated in an effort to improve the quality of public education and actually helped organize a citywide school boycott of the Cleveland Public Schools. And then moved to Chicago with your family. 
Well, no, not quite. So ah. that, that, that those are two separate issues. Um, you know, in the process of applying for colleges, uh, I, I came to the, go to the University of Chicago, mostly because it was in the city of Chicago. I didn't think I wanted to be trapped in a small college town without a large black community. So I chose the University of Chicago to come here. By coincidence, uh, my family, my, my father got a job a year later in uh, Chicago. And so the rest of my family, uh, my parents and my two younger siblings moved to Chicago after I did and, and remained here the rest of the time. So with that background and the continuation of your um, troublemaking in Chicago, why medicine? Why did you decide to go to medical school? How did you see that as part of the role that you were uh, selecting for yourself? Well, so that, you know, um, that's an interesting question. I didn't, I didn't, I'm not one of these people that wanted to be a doctor for, for when I was a little girl. So I really am a product of the sixties and, uh, and I was not oriented toward a career. That is to say, I didn't define what I wanted to do as an adult by what I became. Um, and so my thinking when I applied to college was that I needed to eat and pay bills. Um, and so I said, well, I need to get a job that I don't hate. And I really thought I would be a teacher um, and something that would give me enough stability to do the political organizing that was clearly necessary, you know, after you do your nine to five. That, that was my thinking. Um, I came to Chicago again. I, I, I was a math major uh, as an undergraduate student. Uh, I remember in my first year in Chicago, one of our sociology teachers, actually a very popular uh, young sociologist, called me in and asked me to consider changing my major to sociology. And I told her, well, I, I didn't really want to study uh, history and literature and other things that white people could lie about. So the only purpose of me being in college in my mind of the 1960s era was that I would only study math or science and that the other stuff that white people wanted to talk about, I thought they were lying. So, so I refused to change my major. Um, my roommate, my college roommate is a, was a young sister, a black woman from New York City. By coincidence, her, both of her parents were physicians. And one break or other, uh, I was visiting New York um, and uh, arranging to go out to a party uh, with her and uh, went, went by her house to uh, go out to the party and she wasn't ready. And so I got trapped by her mother who proceeded to question me. And she said, you know, what, what do you wanna do when you finish college? And being a young 1960s radical and a smart aleck, I said, well, I don't know, it doesn't matter. I, I'm a revolutionary. And her mother said, well, that's what's wrong with us. Uh, how many black doctors do you think there are in the country? And again, being a smart ass, I said, not enough, which of course was true. But she actually had a number that was very specific. I don't remember it exactly. It was under 6,000. But she said something like 5,572, some very exact number, which I must admit was much less than what I thought. And then she said, how, and half of those are over the age of 50, and half of those are over the age of 60. And if smart asses like you don't go into medicine, we will die out. So that's the first time that I even considered going into medicine. Uh, and when I returned back to school, I looked some stuff up and sure enough, uh, her numbers were right. Um, and so it's at that point, rather late in my college career, I figured, well, how hard could it be? And by the way, these things that I say now turned out to be true. I said, how hard could it be to be a doctor? What do you do? Open your mouth, say, ah, take a deep breath. It doesn't seem that hard. Um, and that's clearly stable. It's a stable job. Um, so, and it's in science and math, so maybe I should do this. And that's really what tipped me over to applying uh, to medical school. If you had asked me when I graduated, I would have said, who wants to be a bourgeois, uh, petty bourgeois doctor? Um, so really, I really viewed it as like, I could be a plumber or, you know, I mean, I really viewed it in that, in that mindset and I still did not really think of it 
in the typical careerist fashion. I really thought of it as a J-O-B, which would give me a lot of freedom relative to other jobs to uh, do other things that I wanted to do. So young people, let me just, before Peter has me, you know, I'm old, so Peter could ask these questions for, we'll be here for seven hours. So what does that mean for young people? I do think one of the purposes of getting an education is to allow you to gain some skills that you think uh, you will not hate and hopefully enjoy, and that can make some contribution to the world. I think, I think that's something that, that most people want to do. It's certainly something I wanted to do as a young college student. Now, medical school in that era, not to place it very far back, but in that era, uh, and specifically perhaps less so at the University of Illinois, where you went, uh, tried to convince you, I'm sure, that the only substantive thing to be focused on in medicine was the individual and dysfunction of the individual's uh, uh, state of health. How and, and did that, um, uh, did that uh, correlate, if you will, or conflict with your prior social activism and, and what during medical school, um, how did that show? Uh, too long a question, but you know what I mean. <laughs> so, so, so again, I think I think so much of one's attitude toward toward college and toward your training, your residency, uh, your first jobs depends on what else is going around you in society. So, again, I'm a child of the '60s, and so it, fortunately for me, in in that era, there were many other young people who similarly had been activists, whether it was around the war in Vietnam or around civil rights or, or any number of other issues. Um, I, I, do want to, I, I do want to say something because, especially for people of color, I, I do want to tell one story that's probably more important than, than, uh, than stories in Cleveland, which is um, the way we're set up to consider medical school. And I, I, don't think, I think things have actually gotten worse. Um, so uh, I was at the University of Chicago and I was a math major and I had, I had no important uh, pre-med prerequisites. I hadn't taken organic chemistry. You know, I had taken basic stuff, introductory physics, introductory biology. So that meant I had to spend extra time in college. Uh, and in order to do that and financially function, uh, I couldn't stay at the University of Chicago. It, the, the scholarship was disappearing and they were asking me to take a loan. So I actually transferred to our major public university, uh, Circle Campus University of Illinois in Chicago. And actually there, I was able to w function for a couple of years with no scholarship, no financial aid. I worked for the CTA and, and paid my way. That's, that's no longer possible at UIC, even though most of our students, undergraduate students still work. Um, and again, how we structure the difficulty of getting into STEM programs, uh, there was a, a, uh, a certain number of uh, science classes and a certain number of, of spaces. And, and actually, the university called me in at one point um, and said, why are you still here taking up a space? Um, you know, we have lots of students that want to take these science classes. You have more than enough credits to graduate as a math major. Um, and so at the end of the semester, which at that point was December, we are, we're graduating you. And I said, well, you know, I'm not really quite ready to graduate. I still have some spring semester prerequisites. I've applied to medical school. And the university <laughs> laughed and said, you're, you're not getting into medical school. You're taking up valuable space. We're graduating you whether you want to be graduated or not. Um, and so what I did then was walk down the hall and change my major to art history, where I had no courses. So they couldn't graduate me. <laughs> but in any case, back to what Peter asked. So in my mind, we still had the same issue. Uh, I did not feel that, um, I, I didn't feel intimidated by the, by the education system. Uh, the medical college, uh, when I applied for financial aid, told me to, <clears throat> I, I, we skipped an important part. I gave birth to my son. My son was two years old when I started medical school. So uh, when I was uh, looking to arrange my financial aid package, the associate dean said, well, we don't expect you to graduate and we don't want to waste money on you. And if you're serious about being a doctor, you should give up. You should put your son up for adoption. It, I think if I had been born in a different era, 
I might have found that really crushing. But since I was a child of the 60s, I just said, that's what white people do. It makes no sense. So I told him he was crazy and obviously didn't put my son up for adoption. Um, so my point is we structurally put things in place that make it difficult for students of color to apply to school uh, and to survive in medical school. Today, as many of you know that have, are in medical school, but some of you, pre you know, it, it costs $7,000 or more to take reasonable, uh, robust MCAT exams, um, which, which is absurd and financially difficult. And many students <clears throat> that I know that are working class students or students of color, they can't even afford to take the cheap online versions of these review courses, which really hurts them in terms of the application process. And so let me just say here, one of the structural reforms that we would like to see is to change the MCAT scoring. To me, they could have like pass, is ready for medical school, might be ready in a little while for medical school and is not ready for medical school, so, something like that. Not, not these uh, scores on some scale that has no relationship with how one does in medical school and certainly no relationship with one, how one practices. So the issue that Peter is raising is the focus on the individual. Um, but again, uh, at, at the University of Illinois, we did have one lecture in the first year by Dr. Bertram Carno, who is an occupational uh, physician um, who actually came in and talked about workers' health. And in those years, we haven't had it since. We actually had a department of preventive medicine, uh, which still existed when I was in medical school, uh, but they, they've eliminated uh, soon after that. So there was a very little tiny bit in our curriculum that tried to have a population perspective, but more importantly, as a young adult with experience in the world, I knew that populations were critical, that what kind of neighborhood you lived in was important, that what kind of organizations you belonged to was important. So I sort of never bought that uh, individual mantra. Uh, it was a little easier then because their idea was in order to be a doctor, a professional doctor, you had to be distant, you had to be neutral, you had to be a man, and you had to be white. And so I, would, I was none of those things, so then I just discarded all of that. Um, at the University of Illinois especially, but at other medical schools around the country too, medical students organized to have input into their curriculum, just like we see today with medical students, public health students, complaining about the paucity and the, and the bad quality of the curriculums they were forced to learn. Uh, I think in medical school, <clears throat> we've been able to move that needle of what, what's considered a good curriculum. It hasn't moved far enough, but it certainly moved from the time I was there. Um, but still, there was a group of active students, first our students of color in, at U of I, but also other students uh, around the city and around the country that were really fighting against that kind of individual old style, sort of Dr. Marcus Welby style 1950s vision of what a doctor should look like. So, as you're forming your uh, uh, analysis of the world around you uh, and uh, figuring out uh, how you will interact with that world. Uh, race becomes and was central to your, and racism more specifically, to that analysis. And uh, that is not um, common. Um, uh, it is not even uh, common amongst uh, uh, African American or other minority groups. Why and how did, why was race, uh, racism central to your analysis? Well, see, now there I, I want to disagree a little bit. I, I actually, I don't want to make a distinction. I think racism has been central to the analysis of black people for centuries. What language people use to express that centrality how they, how they interact with that concept and, and how they organize themselves to deal with it varies on a lot of things. Uh, so, so I would say most people of color in my class considered racism a major problem. Now, the issue is how do you talk about that um, and what do you do about it? Uh, so I, in my cohort, because we have people who are coming of age as the civil rights movement and the anti-war movement and the environmental movement and the women's movement. All these movements are coming uh, 
in, in the public mind as we're going through college. So we had that background. And so our, our first reaction in the main, it doesn't mean, I want to make a distinction, that doesn't mean everybody was active. Most black people uh, during the 50s and 60s didn't go on marches. Most people, if you just count people, but that doesn't mean they weren't profoundly influenced by those movements. Um, so the fallback position for students, all kinds of students, including students in medical school, was to fall back on that history of activism. Um, and so uh, we had active student organizations. Um, it's, it's, this, is not, this didn't happen when I was in medical school. It happened a little bit before I entered medical school. But for example, AMSA used to be SAMA, used to be student AMA, okay? And, and they broke away from AMA. Our black student organization, SNMA, it had the same relationship. It used to be just like a little <clears throat> component of the National Medical Association, our Association of Black Physicians. They broke away uh, during those years I was in college. By the time I got to medical school, they were, quote, independent. So all throughout that era, you have students trying to be independent, trying to form an idea, an attitude toward the institutions that they're, that they're going to that's uh, not just oppositional, but trying to reform those. You saw that among law students, nursing students. You see it across the board um, in, in those eras. Uh, to, and I think today we are seeing very similar things, uh, but people grab onto the tools that they're familiar with. Uh, and so if you come of age when there's a, social movements are in the forefront, then that's what students tend to grab onto. <clears throat> if you come of age during more quiescent times, then people may grab upon more sort of, uh, how can I say this, careerist kind of tools to build with. But I think students have a natural tendency to want to do well in their profession, and, and they always, fortunately, I think, for the faculty of our schools, they're always pushing and challenging us to really think more carefully about the pedagogy that we're trying to present. So with your, um, or with the concept of the centrality of racism, if you will, as defining the structure of society, you also have been clearly committed within that period of time to uh, questions of economic uh, disparities and um, and uh, economic oppression uh, with, within the concept of uh, racial oppression as well. And I, if you could elaborate on how you see those fitting together, how that impacts on public health and where public health fits within the uh, dynamic of uh, reversing that situation. So I personally have been a socialist, a Marxist for, for years. Uh, in high school, uh, we had study groups that read Black history, that read Marx, that read Limit, Lenin <clears throat> in high school. Um, everyone, I don't care what they do in high school or college, they, they come to medical school or nursing school, public health school, they come to their professional school with a ideological framework that, that allows them to interpret the world. It might be a conservative free market framework, it might be, uh, like in my case, a socialist framework, but, but everyone has one of those frameworks. I think the challenge for all of you <clears throat> is you should be aware of what your framework is. I think too often most people, especially in America, they, they bring these ideological frameworks through which they see things, like white supremacy, for example, and they don't examine that framework because to them, that's what's surround them all the time. So I think the really healthy thing that I like seeing in, in students is where they begin to challenge each other's frameworks and when they begin to reflect themselves and ask themselves, what, what prism am I looking through the world? How am I viewing the world? For public health, uh, I think that uh, we have an international consensus about what causes disease. Uh, I think the, the medical schools and nursing schools have recently tried to move toward that consensus. That's why they talk about social determinants of health. I won't bore you about our little internal fights about what that really means. Uh, but, but for people in healthcare, what you need to ask yourself is, what makes some communities healthy 
and others not healthy? What makes some individuals healthy and other people not healthy? What are the ingredients that you would put together to have a healthy city, for example, or a healthy nation? Uh, and when you begin to ask those questions, uh, I'm confident you, you arrive to some of the things I believe deeply in, but the point is you can then better define and really frame your career uh, and, and what you do and what research you're gonna do if you're gonna do research. Uh, because what you're trying to do, I think, is improve people's health. And, and in order to do that, you have to have to understand at some deep level what makes people not healthy and also what makes people healthy. So yes, my, my attitude in, in healthcare uh, right away, starting off in medical school, uh, is based on my previous experience, uh, my previous activism as a civil rights person, active in the civil rights movement, active in the anti-war movement. And so <clears throat> those philosophical things come together and help explain <clears throat> why hypertension is, is higher among black people or why diabetes is higher among Mexican Americans. So uh, just uh, looking at the um, Q and A thing, either we're not uh, fun either we're not technically opening up to it, or um, uh, people are waiting oh, people, for me to say. You can ask. You can disagree with me. I like that, by the way. That's right. <laughs> so so don't, was, don't be shy about that. Uh, it doesn't just have to be a question. You can, uh, in short order, raise uh, objections or whatever, because all of these will stimulate as we move. I will so, keep asking questions, as Linda says, for hours, but um, uh, we uh, open and invite you to. And let me say um, that uh, we're, this is being recorded. So if you want uh, an opportunity to uh, bring in, ask the questions uh, here that you can look at later, please do so uh, as we're moving along. Go ahead, Linda. So, uh, okay, I'm, I'm, I'm gonna, so let me just say also that that's what's going on today. So I know, I know at Northwestern, I know the medical students and I suspect other students, but, but I at least know about the medical students are raising the question of, of wanting to turn Northwestern into an anti-racist medical school, which, which to me is an amazing thought. Um, but that's going on all over the country. Students all over the country are, are saying we want to examine structural racism. We, we want to find ways to become anti-racist. I think that is a recognition that you have to look at your framework. Someone's asking a question about the focus on social determinants. So let me, let me say this, and, and I'll, I'll refer you to uh, this, this uh, report from the WHO is, is a few years old now. I think it came out in 2008 about health inequity. So this is the general consensus uh, I have disagreements with some minor pieces of it, but, but the general consensus in the world of public health at this point is that what's the most important thing are the structural determinants. And in that framework, the structural determinants, what kind of government you have, uh, what kind of labor laws, you know, do, do you have paid sick days? For example, in the United States, uh, a minority of people have paid sick days. So it's sort of difficult to control flu season without paid sick days. Uh, what kind of, uh, do you have a democratic government or not? Uh, do you have rent control? These structural conditions uh, frame how power is distributed by class, gender, race, and ethnicity, among other things. And that influenced the, the social determinants of health. So in the WHO model, the social determinants of health are really intermediary factors. It's not that they're not important, they're just intermediary and then you get to the individual factors uh, and, and finally health outcomes. So I think in the United States, there's been general confusion first on what the arguments are about this, we call this an eco-social uh, framework of, of how health is produced. Uh, so we're unaware all too often of the international debates about this. And second and most important, we think the social determinants are sort of the root cause. And they're not. They're, like I said, they're intermediary causes. So I think the move to have a more careful look at the social determinants of health is important. Uh, but if you don't understand the whole model, then you, you tend to fall into a more sophisticated blame, blaming the victim sort of uh, notion if, if you think the social determinants of health explain everything and are, are the end of it. Um, so that, that's sort of a brief thumbnail a sketch about that. Um, so uh, just a point, uh, we want to 
uh, you, you hit the first two questions <laughs> quite succinctly, but we do want to give it an opportunity to uh, read them uh, so that uh, we can bounce off them. So, uh, Dr. Murray, uh, what do you, and they're coming in <laughs> galore now, so what do you think about recent discussions of white fragility and these, and these diversity and inclusion sessions now so common in corporate and academic settings? So I, so I have a very uh, jaundiced view towards some of this. First of all, I'm not sure what white fragility means. Uh, if that means being distressed that white supremacy is being challenged, I, I can understand that. But then I think that's a healthy thing. Um, I, I do think that, uh, again, th these changes come reluctantly. And I'm not particularly impressed when people, when corporate uh, groups put in ads that say Black Lives Matter, if they're not moving to change the structural conditions that make Black Lives not matter. Um, so uh, our institutions, the NFL, you name it, whatever you want. I mean, I'm, I, don't, I don't need words to say that. Uh, I've seen this before. Uh, when, when we uh, dealt with segregation, you know, all of a sudden you have people saying, oh yeah, black and white together and singing Kumbaya. But in fact, nothing changed, nothing fundamental, I shouldn't say nothing. Fundamental things did not change. And, and for example, our K through 12 schools are more segregated today than they were in the 50s. So I think if we don't have a real discussion about what we mean by white supremacy, what do we mean uh, by social determinants? What do we mean in terms of what we want to change? Then you have a superficial discussion. So let's talk about some of those things. So we need Amazon to actually pay taxes, okay? Uh, I don't care what signage they have up, Black Lives Matter. Um, so we need to change our tax structure so that corporations and, and the rich pay a huge, much more, most of the taxes because they have most of the money and they've gotten their money off of other people's labor. We really need to change uh, and have a basic income, a minimum income. Uh, we need to make sure that if you have a job and you work, you shouldn't be in poverty. You know, so, so we should have a minimal pay level that, that lifts people not out of the federal poverty level, but out of real poverty. Um, so these are, these are the kind of changes we need. We need to be able to have an election system where it's one person, one vote, and that's not what we have today. Uh, the Electoral College is, is make sure that one person doesn't have, our votes are not equal. Um, and so, so yeah, I'm for abolishing the Electoral College, for example. So these are some structural things that we have to think about changing if we really want to change the history of this country and, and, and really want to address things that concern us all. Uh, what are we going to do? Uh, we should be clear, this pandemic, HIV for that matter, there's so many things that are really connected to the challenge of climate change. Um, these things are all connected. And if we aren't giving our, our people in our country the tools that they need to think about this and analyze these issues and come up with solutions that go to the heart of this matter, uh, then we're not being serious about the, about the change that's needed. Um, by the way, I, I see, I'm looking forward to this other question. I didn't mean to say Northwestern is an anti-racist organization. Linda, read the question. Linda, read the question. It says, you mentioned Northwestern University is an anti-racist organization. Will that mean incorporating international medical graduates as residents? Well, first of all, I, I mentioned that there's a goal <laughs> The, the, in other words, the students have called for Northwestern to become an anti-racist medical school. Uh, so it's an aspiration. It's not a fact. Um, and I think there are lots of things that have to be done before that becomes a reality. And yes, having uh, international medical graduates <clears throat> as residents are one of those. Uh, but you can also look at uh, accepting and supporting our DACA students who are applying for medical school. It's just a crime that, uh, it, this was true a few years ago, I don't know if it's still true, that Loyola had half the DACA medical students in the country were, were based in Loyola. Um, it also means changing the face of Northwestern's classes, medical school classes, um, and, and starting at the college level. It means a whole series of things before Northwestern can, can actively become an anti-racist medical school. Um, so that means important things depending on where that institution is and what surrounds that institution. Um, so, so yes, I think it should, it should be a goal, but 
Northwest is a long way away from it. And somebody, some this uh, next question, I can. <laughs> this is uh, this is not, not your fault. Let me orchestrate this at all. I see. Go ahead. <laughs> this is not your fault because they misled you in, in the introduction. This question is: What are some of the things you love most about working in your current position? I am happily retired. Um, now, some people would argue that there's not a big difference between my retirement and when I wasn't retired, but uh, here it's clear that I just do exactly what I want, uh, period. Uh, so um, I actually, uh, when I turned 70 two years ago, I, re I stopped seeing patients. Um, I felt that was a good age to, to not be in danger of killing my patients. Um, and since then, I, I do teach uh, a bunch of classes at uh, the School of Public Health, um, but I only do that because I, I like to do that. Um, I like uh, teaching and I like interaction, acting with the younger people. Um, so the best thing I like about retirement is I get to do exactly what I want. And if there are boring meetings, I don't have to go to them. If I decide I don't feel like going to them, I just turn off the Zoom and don't go. So being retired is great. <laughs> so uh, let me ask you, uh, there have been a number of questions about how to participate in public health initiatives without uh, healthcare training or medical training uh, being in some other field. And, and maybe that overlaps some to this uh, talk about your work with APHA as well. We can put a number of these together. Well, the American Public Health Association is, is our largest uh, and uh, public health organization in the United States, one of the largest in the world. And it, it's my, it is my major professional organization and has been for my whole career. And one of the things I like about it is that it does not just include medical people. It obviously doesn't just include doctors. They're, they're a minority within the association, always a good sign. But if you look at doctors and nurses and dentists and all, they're there, but they're not the majority. <laughs> and it's not only them. We have educators. We have lawyers. Uh, uh, we have every profession you can think of can be an APHA, it's determined not by what their training is or discipline is, it's determined primarily by where they're active. And so I would say that every field is using public health, whether they know it or not. If you're an architect, I, I love working with people in other fields. I've worked, had the pleasure of working with some architects on specific projects and buildings. And when you have a discussion with them, you can talk about the public health implications of what they do. They actually train on this, but they don't call it public health. Uh, urban planning is another field. Social work, these are fields that I think are intimately connected to public health, where they're actually actively considering what happens beyond the individual, what happens as people interact with the environment and with each other. Um, so, so I can't think of an area that is not touched by public health. I think one of the tasks of those of us with training in healthcare is um, to make sure that our information and technical knowledge is communicated to the other fields and to listen to them uh, because that informs our work as much as we inform theirs. Um, so so I, I would have to say over my career, that's been the most fun of <clears throat> what I've done when I'm actually working with other people who aren't physicians, who aren't professionals. Now, for some reason, my little, I don't know whether you're, okay. Uh, so um, could, I, could I take you also, just for a few minutes uh, about unions in general. As the longest serving president of uh, the House Staff Union in the County Hospital, um, do you have some thoughts about that and uh, some of the difficulties uh, uh, that uh, race presents within uh, unions and uh, racism presents within unions and, uh, and the struggle in this country? Well, labor unions are, are an important organization in every country, especially in ours. <clears throat> and let me just say that, um, you know, growing up, most of the people that I knew when I was a child worked in, in auto plants in Cleveland uh, or drove buses or things like that. These are organizations, especially when I was growing up, that had strong unions. So <clears throat> I always have had a positive attitude toward unions. If you, if, you're, if you come to work anywhere and you're just by yourself, you get screwed. I mean, it's that simple. And if you join together with your co-workers, you're in better shape <clears throat> to get things that you need to do your job. Uh, so to me, that was like a no-brainer. Um, we the, the house staff at Cook County, like house staffs in our other large public hospitals, uh, have been organized for decades. And I did, Peter says, longest serving. That's because we usually serve for a year. 
But uh, when I was president, we were in danger of losing county. So I actually served for two years. Um, and today, because of my professional field as an occupational environmental health expert, uh, I cont have continued to work with unions throughout my career um, in, in the health and sa safety realm. Um, so, uh, so yesterday, I was on a call with union people as they, they were talking about training of hazardous work workers, for example. Um, so this is just another organization that allows people to band together. They've had profound influence on our country and our, our laws, etc. Now, unfortunately, the labor unions in the United States have been weakened in my career, in my lifetime. So now only <clears throat> less than 10%, really about 8% of private sector workers are in unions. This is really unfortunate. And in the public sector, about a third of all workers are unionized. Um, and that really weakens uh, the American people. In countries that have stronger union movements like Canada and throughout Europe, where 70, 80, 90 percent of workers are unionized, you find stronger medical care laws and, and universal health insurance. You find better protections for the voting process. So I, in my personal opinion, there's no question that strong militant unions that are representing the interests of, of the people of that country uh, make the nation much, much better. Um, and so, um, so that's one of our issues in the United States that our labor unions have become as weak as they are. Uh, but still, in spite of that weakness, they, they form a critical um, a bulwark against uh, bad things going on. So also, I will say this, I've spent a lot of my career, we haven't talked about, so I, I've spent a lot of my career as a boss. In other words, I, I've had increasing higher positions within the world of, of medicine. Uh, and I, I certainly uh, would be considered an experienced medical physician executive, uh, including uh, within our county system, which is one of the larger systems in the country. Um, so I will say as a boss, it's always better to have strong unions. It's much easier to manage if you're, if you're just gonna do your jobs as a boss, if you have strong unions that are in touch with their members and that, <clears throat> that are fighting for the better conditions of the system. And so I'd much rather be in a unionized setting as a boss than a non-union setting. Um, I, I don't know if very many bosses agree with me on that, but even though you get challenged by the union, that challenge is so important if you're gonna do your good job. So I actually, I have two left. We're running, uh, uh, I think people are worried we're running toward the end here. Um, one is too esoteric. So let me ask you the second one uh, first. And that is, um, uh, uh, you're advocating a great deal of uh, troublemaking, if you will, as you call it. Um, and um, I don't, especially in this day and age, aren't you worried about retribution for that? Or if you were just coming out of training and in an academic position or some others, um, won't, won't you and haven't you suffered for your outspoken advocacy over your career period? And then you can transition that into what you think is the most important thing for public health people to be doing at this moment. <laughs> so the answer to your question, so let me be clear. If you stand up for things you believe in that are not in sync with the power structure of today, you will get in trouble. You know, so, so by the way, I, you know, one thing I disagree with brother, brother Lewis, he always talked about getting in good trouble. I don't know what good trouble, I, get in trouble, worry later whether it's good or bad. Uh, I guess if you, if you make progress, maybe it's good. Um, but uh, you take a risk and you do take a risk to your career. And certainly I was blacklisted uh, from a job in Chicago after I finished my residency <clears throat> and actually had to flee to Canada for several years. Uh, uh, not a horrible place to practice. I learned a lot and really enjoyed it, but uh, it took it took uh, several years to make my way back into the Chicago area. So you need to be crystal clear that when you stand up for anything, for yourself or for colleagues, you are at risk. And that's why having organizations and unions are so critical. Let, let me give you some very specific examples. So yes, I, I did see, I was quote, punished for being an activist uh, resident. 
uh, and trying to keep Cook County Hospital open. Um, today, I, I, I'm, I'm going to say these names. I, I don't really, I don't know. I know him by reputation, the head of CDC. He's a competent, well-respected public health person. But what does it mean to have a leadership within the CDC, I don't want to focus just on the head, that has not found a way to communicate what they really think to the American people in this present crisis? You know, what does it mean to have physicians, someone mentioned earlier, most physicians support Medicare for all, but they don't speak about it. There are organizations that do speak and support Medicare for all. We have the Physicians for a National Health Program, but even the American College of Physicians, the pediatric folks, miscellaneous <clears throat> surgical groups, organizationally take a stand uh, for Medicare for all. Some people will be more active uh, and out front. Other people will be a little shyer. The point is you, you have to take a stand. And, and even if you think you're being quiet, you're really taking a stand. So if you, if you choose not to say anything, you're really supporting what exists today. So there's no way to avoid it. The way I think about it is a, a, a different way. Um, my great-grandmother, who was born during the period of Reconstruction, uh, spent time when I was a little child uh, with our family. And this is what she told me, and I've never forgotten this. She said, Linda, white people are always going to knock you down. And the only thing you have to decide in life is how often you're going to try to stand up. And that's how I really feel about it. Um, I, if you look at me as a child growing up in the projects in Cleveland to having an MD and, and having all these nice sounding jobs and titles, um, that doesn't mean they're not trying to knock you down. And if you don't stand up, then you might as well stay down. Uh, so I, I don't consider the decision of being active a choice. Uh, to me, if you're breathing, you're going to be active. Um, I don't know all the names of the people that we're demonstrating in memory of that the police have killed. We don't even know all the people that have been killed. Um, and it doesn't matter. Sometimes they were just sleeping in their bed and they got killed. Sometimes they were following the instructions of the police and they got killed. Sometimes they were talking back to the police and they got killed. Sometimes they were running away from the police. It doesn't matter if you have a structure that does not see black lives or Native American lives or Mexican lives or Puerto Rican lives as valuable, then you're in danger of getting killed. And even if you successfully avoid it, your children are in danger of getting killed. So to me, what I can say after 72 years is that all of you should be furious. All of you should be mad as hell. I talked about being in Cleveland, Ohio at 18, uh, the National Guard was called out in that summer when I was 18 in Cleveland. They were called out because we were having demonstrations against police brutality. This summer, my youngest grandchild was 18, having just graduated from high school. And she was out in the streets in the George Floyd and other demonstrations over 50 years later on the same damn issue the police beating up and killing black people. So what I have to say when I look back on my years of work is we didn't work hard enough and we weren't successful that we haven't moved the demands of these demonstrations off this same fact of having people killed in the streets and now it's done in front of us live on Facebook. Uh, what progress have we made? So we really do need physicians and lawyers and public health people and everybody else to stand up together so that we can make fundamental changes in this country. Let me ask you a last question, I guess, and it's sort of on the issue that's raised uh, by the final question on the QA. There's, a, there's clearly a lot of work to be done. How do we think, how do you think we can get results? More diversity in public health, representation and policy writing, getting more diverse representation into office. And I would ask you to speak specifically to minority students, African-American, uh, Latinx, other minority students about organization. Uh, I am uh, very fascinated by the term national in form and internationalist in vision. And how do you see that uh, with respect to organization? Because most of what you've been describing 
are general organizations, uh, focused uh, advocacy organizations. Uh, what about the content and also the organization within minority communities? So that question is, so first let me back up. I think we have to be clear what language we're talking about. I don't like the language diversity because I don't know what that means. It means hairstyle or what. Uh, if what you mean is we need to have the most vulnerable communities represented, I, I can relate to that and you can define what those are. So, so I think one of the problems we have had, certainly in up higher education, is we've used the term diversity in an inappropriate and frankly fraudulent way. Let me give you an example. All my degrees come from the University of Illinois. The University of Illinois, UIC, argues that they are, have the most diverse campus in the nation or one of the most diverse campuses in the nation. Okay, you can look at that and they can point to figures. When I was an undergraduate student there, 22% of the undergraduate students were black. Today, 8% of the undergraduate students are black. So, and so is that progress or not? I would say, no, it's not. <clears throat> it's institutional and structural racism that we see going on there. Um, so we have, to, we have to clearly define what we mean. Uh, am I interested in a woman coming on the Supreme Court because Harpy G was a woman? No, not if there's some crazy right-wing person that's against everything I stand for. So again, we, we have to be clear we need to be anti-racist, which is different than being diverse, and we have to fight for the representation of people that we support, communities uh, that, that we think are important. Organizing. You know, I, this is, I, Sir Michael Merrimont has this, at, at this point, this is my approach. You should belong to organizations. If you don't find one you like, start one. Um, on the American left and on the international left, we have all kinds of fights about how those organizations should look. At this point, I don't really care. Um, we, Black Lives Matter, for example, has chosen a very diffuse, uh, decentralized structure, very different from the 1960s where we had major national <coughs> organizations in a more traditional structure. It's not clear to me that one structure is inherently better than another. What's clear to me is, does, do those organizations allow people to be in motion? And, and the motion that we're in as people, are they making progress? Are we focused enough to say what we want uh, and, and to make that stick? Um, and so that's, that's, I think, the most important thing. So what I have to tell students today is join your student organizations. If you're in school, join them. You can belong to other organizations that aren't student organizations, but join your student organizations. It's always, as an organizer, been my experience that you do your best organizing work with the things that are closest to you. So if you're spending 40 hours a week or 60 hours a week or 80 hours a week in school activities, you need to do some organizing there. Uh, and, and so start organizing where you are, organize as broadly as you can, and belong to organizations that you think are moving in the direction you want to move into, and then find a way to work with other people that are in other organizations. And with that, we thank you so much for this hour and for uh, joining this series. We thank IFAM and Dr. Ackerman for uh, hosting this and uh, uh, the group uh, that have joined us today. Uh, we hope you got what you were looking for here and thank you for joining us today. Thank you.